be thinking about a burden. I like the kind of word burden because it is kind of a weight that's placed on these folks. And you can look at it that way or you can look at it as, as a pronouncement. You can look at it as a saying. You can look at it like a word. It's something like reading Psalm 19. Uh, all of those words are so similar, but they are different. So we're not going to push the issue on the definition. But as you think about it, you can, you can be visioning, is this prophecy? Is this just a pronouncement or whatever? So that, that's basically where we're going with the word. Now, some common reasons why God brought these oracles, these pronouncements against these folks. Now, I want you to read. Somebody turn to Isaiah 13 and read 13 verse 11. Okay. Somebody read Isaiah 14. Verses 13 to 15. Somebody got that? Raise your hand if you have that one. Okay. Somebody read Isaiah uh, 14, verse 32. Okay. Somebody read uh, Isaiah 16, verse 6. Okay. And somebody read uh, Isaiah uh, 19, verses 3 through 5. Okay. And then finally, uh, Isaiah 23, verse 9. Okay. So we got all of those covered. So the first one was Isaiah 13, verse 11. Whoever has that, just read that. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud. I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Woo. Okay, <laughs> that's a mouthful. Okay, kind of hold, hold on to that and say, okay, what is, what is, what is God saying there? Somebody have Isaiah 14, 13 to 15. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of the sky. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the stately mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Okay. Uh, are you are you already getting a feel for what what's going on there? Somebody have fourteen thirty two. How then will one answer the messenger of the nation? But the Lord has found Zion, and the afflicted of His people will seek refuge in it. Okay, now that one's a slightly different. Okay, so kind of pick up on what what's being said there. Why is God, you know, against the, these folks? Uh, I think what was the next one? Sixteen six. We have heard of Moab's That's another mouthful. Okay. All right. Um, 19, 3 through 5. The Egyptians will lose heart, and I will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums, and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord Almighty. The waters of the river will dry up, and the riverbed will be parched and dry. Wow. Okay, that, that's that's. I think that kind of gives us a picture of what God is trying to say to these folks. I, I hope I hope we're kind of listening to kind of pick up on. Sometimes you have to kind of read between the lines, and then sometimes it's just very obvious what he, what God is saying. You, you don't have to have a doctorate in anything to understand that. Okay, okay. The last one was twenty three verse nine. Does somebody have that one? The Lord Almighty planned it to bring low the pride of all glory and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. Okay. Okay. It's, it's kind of obvious. There's a couple of things that stand out right away. Almost, not in all of them, but in most of them. Which is what? What is it? Pride. Pride. Okay. Now, without getting into the, all of the other interrogatives, what's the problem with pride? Putting yourself first, which means you become a God. You if you become you first, God. there can't be two first. No. Right? When you got two leaders, nobody's leading. So if you got, yeah, you got two first, you got a second. Okay. God is saying that doesn't work. Okay. Any, anything else you, you pick up on? Um, it's, it, coupled with that pride, something else is, is stated in many of them.
we have our plans, but, but when, when we want to be number one, then what in essence we're saying is that we're, we're the cat's meow, as they used to say. We're, we're, we're kind of it. And I don't need anyone else telling me what to do, how to do, when to do, where to do. And God is saying, that's not going to work. Okay? Uh, and as we read a, a little bit more, we, we, we'll see that. And anything else? Now, there was one that was a little different. Um, that God is not pleased with something else. Yes. Haughtiness, okay. Um, God seems to be saying that when you have been elevated for whatever reason to power, uh, you, you are not to take advantage of the powerless. You are not to take advantage of those that are below you, quote, below you. Because there's only one up here, and that's God, not not you. Okay, all right. Let's let's let's. And any questions or observations there from what we've seen? Okay. Um. We'll talk a little bit. I hope at the end, but I I think we've kind of nailed what what pride is all about. Pride, to me, is 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 the epitome of idolatry because it elevates me above everybody, everything, and even God. And so that's, we'll talk at the end about that because sometimes we're proud of things and we need to understand what we mean when we say that. Uh, there have been some things I've been proud of and I'll talk about that. Um, and I'll, I'll have to make sure when I look back at that that I was really theologically on the right track or maybe I wasn't back then when we talk about, about pride. Okay. Let's look, let's look specifically at some of, some of the nations that God pronounced on the, the, these oracles, you know, this, these prophecies, these proclamations. Okay. It's interesting that he starts with Babylon. And I say it's interesting because the people, if you, if starting with Babylon, Babylon wasn't a threat to these folks. Remember Isaiah, um, I guess, was commissioned formally. We said that at the temple when, when the king, King uh, Isaiah died, which was probably 740 or so, somewhere in there, 740 BC. But the Assyrians, I mean, the Babylonians really didn't come into power to much later than that. Now, they were in existence. All of you that have taken, uh, I remember my Western civilization, not Western civilization, but the uh, history of civilization, you got to go to Mesopotamia. You got to go to, to uh, talk, talk about the Babylonian, Babylonians and Babylon. And this was, this was before Abraham's time. This was almost 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. Abraham was around 2,000 approximately. So here, this nation existed, but it was not the powerful nation that it, that it became. Okay. So when, I, when Isaiah is talking about this nation, they're saying, wait a minute. Our threat is not the Babylonians. You should be talking about the Assyrians. They're the ones that's the threat. But Isaiah is trying to show them something about what's going to happen. And we, we know ultimately that, that, the, that the Babylonians became you know, symbolic of all that is prideful, all that is evil, all that exalts us. And basically, I, I think, well, I think most people think for, for one simple reason. Why, why, was, why was Babylon elevated in the minds of a lot of people as the epitome of, of pride and evil? Well, Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> and the wonders of the world. Yeah. It, 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 was, it was a place, you know, that, that not only the militarily, you know, because of the wall and all of that, uh, but it, it was... A place that you just, you just, you, you wanted to see it. You know, if if you you know, when people come to visit here in Florida, there's certain places you take them, right? In Babylon, you say, hey, we gotta go see go see Nebuchadnezzar stuff, okay? And so, really, and so the the place had been so elevated in the minds and the hearts of folks, not just as far as their power, but uh, in the sense of, of the beauty. But also, um, these, these were some, some cruel uh, 
I, I was going to do a, a psychological study on Nebuchadnezzar in one of my classes, never got around to it. But there was a man who had some, some serious anger issues, some serious anger issues, uh, who went from uh, resentment to anger to rage to not only will I kill you, I'll kill your whole family. That was, that was his thinking. So these, these were not folks that you invited over for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> If you, if you did, you better be prepared to <laughs> do something with, the, with these folks. So, so here, here we are with this nation now that it was not even a power, powerful nation yet. And yet, you know, Isaiah starts with these folks because he, want, he wants them to get a picture here of not only is, is, is God the sovereign God, he wants them to understand even though these folks will be elevated, and we eventually, you know, sack Jerusalem, the whole deal. Ha! Ah, God's got a plan. And God is still sovereign. And God's going to be in control whether or not you think he is or, or you think he isn't. He, they're symbolic of, 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 of power, sy symbolic of all that elevates, elevates, elevates self. Now, power. The misuse of power, we're going to talk a little bit at the end. Hopefully we have time to do this. The misuse of power, is power in and of itself wrong? Some, some of you are shaking your head no, and some of you are kind of saying, hmm, is, is power in and of itself wrong? No. No. Why not? Power gets things done, okay. Okay, it depends how it's attained. How it's attained. Okay. Okay. The, the whole thing with celebrating Pentecost, you know, the whole thing about power. If we have, when we, when we are dwelt by the Spirit, there's power. So there can't be anything inherently wrong with power. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, as, as, as a pastor, I, I work with a lot of other pastors, and I find that a lot of times what people don't understand is that you have power, but you make decisions without thinking about how those decisions impact the people that you lead. You often can really unintentionally cause a lot of hurt and harm just because you don't understand that, you know, obviously Christ used his power to serve. Right. You know, so okay. it, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult <laughs> thing because a lot of people have good intentions, but they don't realize that that's not enough. You know, and then of course a lot of people use the power for wicked things. Right, right. I, I think. Um... I don't want to say subconsciously. I think very easily it's, it's, you can slide into what, what the pastor is saying here. I think you can have great intentions, but because of, of this, this propensity we have to elevate self, even though we say we're not, uh, very easily sometimes we slide into having this power, having this power work against some people that are that are w working with us yeah yeah i think what comes to my mind in the life of a believer whether that's old testament or new testament our power is to, to be operated in god's power his power is to be operated through us okay you know and and i think that that's what the lord wanted in the old testament he wanted to be their not only their king but he wanted to be their power you know you see okay. this and he wins the battles okay okay yeah, I was listening to the um, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir on the way over here, and they were singing a great song, All of My Steps in Your Word, Lord. It's a great song. And, you know, or, how are your steps being ordered? You know, is, is God the one who is, who is directing and guiding? Is the Holy Spirit the one? Are uh, other believers, you know, who is the one? You know, where does the power come from? You know, and then what is the purpose of my heart in attaining this, attaining this power? Um, and we can, we'll, later on, I'm sure we can all talk about how we've seen power abuse and, and how it's still being abused today. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
in, in chapter 17, we, um, after, after he talks about um, Babylon, uh, he talks about Damascus, and, and coupled with Damascus is, is Israel. And it's kind of interesting here, historically, of, of what's going on here. Um, when, you, when you read through chapter 17, you start to pick up on this whole idea of God is not, not pleased when we decide that someone or something else is going to be our deliverer or someone or something else is, is what we can rely on. Um, and so here, here's Damascus in, in Israel. Uh, here you have the Assyrians and, and the, these folks, you start depending on one another rather than on, on, on God. So here's, here are people who for years, God had, had delivered them. So you would think, I heard people say, well, we look at the children of Israel. If anybody should have trusted God, it should have been the children of Israel. Look what they saw, you know? I said, yeah, but we got the whole God's revelation. We got the whole Bible. We got people preaching to us every week. And so we still start depending on ah, other people, other, other circumstances to, uh, to deliver us. So God, God is, is not, was not pleased with this whole idea that you, you are now shifting. You are now shifting your dependence from me to someone else. Have you, have you ever found, found yourself starting with God, praying and trusting God, and then before you know it, you know, you say, well, everybody needs people, yeah, and before you know it, you're way over here, and God is, is back there as far as who, we, who we're relying on. Um, I just had this physical thing. Um, many of you know I, I went on this trip. By the time I got back, I, I couldn't even walk. So you say, okay, you know, Pastor Gary, you 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 know, you need to you need to trust God in this, right? Isn't that true? But somebody would also say, you you need to see a doctor. So you go see the doctor, then they go. <laughs> Then they send you to another one. Then they send you to another one. So you, you've seen two or three. And very easily now, you, without, without even thinking about it, it shifts. It shifts. That now I'm really dependent on these folks. Now I'm not saying I'm not thankful for the doctors. I'm not thankful for what they can do. When I go to Dr. Greer, who's my doctor, I, I'm not going to say I don't care if he's a Christian. But he is a Christian. But I'd rather him have gone to med school than know every verse in the Bible. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? Right. But what I'm saying is it's easy sometimes without even thinking about it to start to shift. And you don't even realize now that you've shifted from trust. And initially, when I could barely, when I walked into the house, I needed my cane. And, you know, I, I would give, I use the word proud. Uh, I, can't, I can't be proud. Of, of how I've done physically, because that's the hereditary. My folks live to be 90-something, so that, that's something about genes. So I can't boast about the fact that I've, I've, I've stayed in good shape. But the point is, when you start relying, when you start relying, and I think very close, I was close to this trusting in these folks. So I said, wait a minute, God's in control. My house thing up in New York. You know, I got a realtor, got all these people working with us. But you know who worked that thing out? God did. Some of you were praying because you knew the situation up there. It was God who worked that out. And I was, the, I was totally dependent on God and that thing because there was nothing anybody could do. Nothing. These doctors are good, but ultimately, all healing is from God. Whether he uses aspirin or whether, whether he uses a doctor. So think about it. Do, can you find yourself shifting very, very slowly towards trusting in us something else. God is, God is saying, wait a minute, what about me? <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> you mean God is not on, on your time schedule sometimes? Right. And so when we, we get 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I I think I think we've gotten the the point here of what God is saying uh, to 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 both both uh, Israel and to and to Damascus here. Uh, when when we look at chapter twenty three, uh, we got to move on here. Looking at Tyre, really, really interesting. This this place kind of reminds me of. Um, when you're in the military, you, you go into different ports and, and it's like, like, like people who come to Florida and they drive down to the beach. <laughs> they, all these places want you to stop to get something. Okay? And that's, that's basically the, the, the way it is. So Tyre was this place that was uh, economically, commercially, they were at the top. They were at the top. And they were at the top because of some natural things. They were at the top because of where they were located, because they were right there, right there on the sea. All of the ships would come in, all, all of the people with commercial stuff, they would have to come there and let it off to, be, to travel someplace else. So they got very much caught up in their resources and, and, and how that resource for them almost became became their God. Now, let me, let me answer this question. We will examine this at the end again. How, how is it possible they had a strength which was the port, which was basically the seaport? How can your strengths become your weakness? Okay, when they're overused. When you start, okay, overuse, you start depending on yourself. Environmental changes, your harbor could silt up. Environmental changes, you, I missed the letter. Your, your harbor could silt up. Okay. A hurricane yeah. hits <laughs> <laughs> Well, a hurricane hits now. And what does that, what, what would that teach you about this resource? People, uh, nations, uh, groups of people can easily shift to um, this whole idea of taking that thing that is a strength now and it becomes a, a weakness. Have, have you ever been in meetings with people and their strength is, uh, they're very analytical and they're able to really see what's going on and and, and you know, almost like the, like the people from... Uh, it's a car where they, they, they knew how to interpret the times and what to do about it. And you got people like that when you thank the Lord for them. But that, that strength can become a weakness. <laughs> and you use it all the time. There are some times, perhaps, when that person should back off from that and say, I've been in meetings where people who have different capacities use it all the time. And, and it, starts, it doesn't accomplish what they wanted to accomplish because it's overworked. And somewhere along the line, people need to learn, or, or nations need to learn, that our strengths, our strengths. Have you ever had a, one of your strengths become a weakness? Well, I'm thinking about, I, I'm a very routine person. And so that works well for me because I tend to have, I tend to do things the same way. And so I don't waste a lot of energy having to rethink how to do something all the time. Yeah. But then the downside of that is when, when something interrupts that routine, <laughs> I can, you know, so it, it definitely works against me if I'm okay. not aware that that's not, okay. that's not where my hope, being, being routine is not where my hope is, Okay. you know, uh, but it's very hard for me when something interrupts yeah. routine. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I went through some stuff at Liberty, we, we, we did all these vignettes where we would watch certain things and kind of try to diagnose what, what was going on. And certain people have the ability to immediately pick up on certain things that are going on. And unfortunately, sometimes when you have that capacity, then it, <laughs> you start to almost start to interpret everything the same way. That, uh, you know, you've done a lot of reading on depression or anxiety or whatever. And so everybody that now even has a slight, you know, they, they say a couple of words, immediately you say, ah, 
Well, that's that strength now that you have. Now is no longer a, a, a strength. It's it's be it's become a weakness. So we need to be aware. All of us in there have strengths. Everybody in there has strengths. And we need to say, is is this strength under the guidance and direction and 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 and, and the boring along of God, or is it is it is it all all about me? So here is here is this nation that feels they got it all together. But here again, they are the, uh, the epitome of symbolizing this, this cosmopolitan spirit of commercialism. And we won't even talk about that at the end. We'll talk a little bit about that and, and where we are. Let's look specifically at, at the whole thing with Moab and the difference in the tone of this message. Why, why if, if, you, if you go back and you, and you read in chapter 16, <laughs> why does this sound different? Why does it sound like this, this, is, this is not God kind of coming down while he is? It, it's, it's almost not, not like a, a, a judgment that he's just that beating these people down, but it, it, it's yes, it's about judgment, but the, the language is different. The language is, most of you know why. Why, 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 why is there a heartfelt Sympathy towards these folks, the, as far as Moab is concerned. Anybody remember? Who are these folks? Genesis nineteen. They were the ones that would not allow Israel to pass through as they were going to the new land. Okay, but is, is okay. Is if that is that why God has has sympathy towards these folks? Okay. Okay. And they were rejects. There's a couple other reasons we'll talk about in a minute why they were ultimately rejects, because they teared, uh, teamed up with some other people to attack their own people. So Genesis 19, remember, remember Lot and his daughters? They said, listen, we need to have an heir, and we don't have one. Let's get our father drunk, and he'll go to bed with us. And he did. Now you got the Moabites. The other daughter said, wait a minute, you did that, I can do the same thing. So, so there was a, there's a connection here. There's a connection here. And God kind of sees that connection. And yet, um, I think one of my favorite verses you hear me quote all the time is God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. I think the first time that's used, in, and I think it's, it's Exodus 34, and the, the rest of that verse says, yet he would not leave the guilty unpunished. Okay? So God is gracious, compassionate, and so forth, but he, he, won't leave, he won't leave the guilty unpunished. So here, here are these folks that really ultimately are part of the promise. Um, boy, I have to get the verse. Uh, I, know, I know it says it's, I always say, you, you should be able to quote where it is. It's got to be near the end of uh, Exodus. Where was Moses buried? In Moab. <laughs> in, 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 that, in, that same, in that same land. So there is, there's a connection here. There's a connection that God has. And yet, because they ultimately sided with folks against their own people, God says, this, this is, this is not, not going to work. So as a, as a believer now, you know, we, we have a special relationship, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We have a special relationship with, with God, don't we? Hello? Yes, You're looking at me like, really? I, I hope that's how you see this. We have a special relationship, and it's not based upon who we are, what we've done, when we've done it, but it's based upon what Christ has done. It's based upon the, uh, now who we are, as they say, but who, who, who we belong to. Okay. So where, where, where do we go when we, when we start looking at ourselves, our nation, what God was doing in, in these other spots? When you look at Jerusalem and God also pronounced one of these oracles against, of all places, Jerusalem. 
why, why would they do this with Jerusalem? The same reason. Because they start relying not upon God, but upon other nations and other people to deliver them. So, why, why, what does this teach us about God and how he views other nations? In love of Rome, faithful as a man should not, one who in judging seeks justice and pleads the cause of righteousness. Like, you know, from the from the house of David. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, the, the first word in there is love. Okay. God is love. He expects people to love him and love others. Okay. And when the fire gets out of whack, <laughs> there's no love. And you see that in David's life. It's very powerful. He was so powerful he could have Joab have somebody killed. Yeah. To cover up his sin. You know? And uh, and I think that what God is seeing is a lack of love for him, a lack of love for his commands and his law, a lack of love for others. And that kind of summarizes the whole thing in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, when 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 we look at the whole thing with with, with Moab and uh, what 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 God is is saying here is that yeah, uh, there there should be a special relationship, and that that re relationship doesn't happen and sustain itself automatically. You know, the just shall shall walk by faith. There's Old Testament, just just like New Testament. So these folks needed needed to walk in faith, trust in God, and believe in God. Rather, rather than trusting and believing something else. I mean, I, idolatry really is at the, at the, I think, the forefront of all of this. Uh, and, and so when, when we look at, look at the fact that God is not pleased with the proud, with the arrogant, with those uh, uh, who would take advantage of other folks, okay? But yet, he he's he. What does it mean when when he when he put that, when he says this to these people? What is he trying to do? Is he just trying to lambast them and beat them up? What's the purpose? Yeah, you know, I I think sometimes we think that God over there just wants to zap people, and God over here in the New Testament is wants everybody to come into repentance. But th th there was no difference really. Over here. So God gives people a chance. I think God gives people a chance. You got a choice. What you're referring to is in chapter 15, two verses, 11 and 12. This is uh, God talking. He says, My heart is a nest for the Lord, like the harp of the most king. When Moab appears at her high place, she only wears herself out. She goes to her shrine to pray. Oh, and that's that yeah. what you're talking about in terms of the heart of God. Right. It's really for all these people that he judges, but they they just persist in pursuing you know their own agendas and their own gods, denying and defying one whose yeah. heart breaks. Their own, their own agenda, uh, wanting to do things their way, when they want it done, how they, how they want it done. Um, one of the questions that was asked in the book, and I was almost reluctant to go down that road, but if, if God were to write one of these to our nation, what would he say? What would he say? This is to the United States of America. What would he say? Repent and come back to me. Repent and come back to me. And then he would have to show us how how we've turned and gone another direction. And we and we would have to understand. Okay, yeah. In all, in order to repent, there's got to be with my thinking anyway. There's got to be a change of thinking. I need you know. I always use the illustration when we're driving, and Janie says, "I think we're going the wrong way." Until I make up my mind 
that I don't recognize anything that we, <laughs> I'm recognized we're going the wrong way. Until in my mind I realize that I'm not going to turn. So it, it's, it's a matter of, of coming to some conclusion mentally that says, ah, I need to make a change here, and then you make a change. No, nah, we won't get into <laughs> Thank you. Um, great, great point. But that's, it's, it's so easy. It's easy for me to point out pride in somebody else. <laughs> it's very easy. For, well, I'm not going to say for you, but for me to do that. But, but when that spotlight comes back, sometimes, you know, I, I, I want to justify, yeah, but God is saying, no, 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 no. You need to look very seriously here at what is happening. You're part of this nation. And so maybe God is saying, if you believe God would say X, Y, and Z, what am I doing as an ambassador, as light and salt, what am I doing to arrest, to stop the decay? What am I doing to preserve that which is good? What am I doing to take the message that he gives and the power and the authority that he, I have none. I have nothing. I have nothing except what God gives me. You have nothing except what God gives you. So when I, when I start to criticize the nation, I need to ask myself, and God is asking, what are you doing? What are you doing to correct it? He said, well, I, I can't go. I can't talk to all these senators and all the, to the vice president and president. I can't do that. No, you can't. But who can you talk to? There's somebody. There's somebody that you can share with. Somebody you can share what thus saith the Lord. Somebody that you, you can pray with. So what, what, what okay, we need, one, one comment was that God would say to the United States of America <laughs> that you need to repent, you need to turn because you, you've turned from it. What, 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 okay, anybody agree with that? Have, have, as the United States of America, Turn from God and go in another direction. Yeah. Really? Okay. Help me out. How, where? How do you see that? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Ted? It's family. It's where this comes from. Okay. Family and teaching their children about God and what's right and wrong. Okay. So you say God would, would say, let's, let's get back to the foundation that we're talking about on Wednesday, that we are created in the image of God. And God expects us, as, as created beings, 
to make sure that we're instructing people that are, that are under our care in, in the ways of God, not the ways of the culture. I mean, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so he says, we need to get back to that. Um, most, most of us here kind of grew up, or well, many of us, you know, grew up when there was, even though <laughs> it wasn't as solid as some people think it is, uh, there, was a, there was a sense back when I grew up in the 40s and 50s that uh, there were certain things that were right, there were certain things that were wrong. And I remember as a, as a child, as a kid growing up, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be coming back from playing basketball down at the junior high school, and a guy might, might say a bad word or something, and everybody would do this, because they said, boy, I'm a, I, I, don't want, I don't want hit by that lightning. <laughs> I mean, that, that was some, some bad theology, but on the other hand, it was a sense that there was something that was right and was wrong. There's consequences for that. But the, who's, who, who's worried about what God thinks now? You can say anything you want, do anything you want. It's, it's okay. In some spheres, anyway. In some, in some atmospheres. Yeah, some people want to claim that, right? But we, ah, God is saying, you, you, you are my people, and I want you to, to take a stand. Okay, so the whole family thing, uh, the, the whole, I, whole idea that uh, you, you've turned from all that I have instructed you to do to set up your own parameters, your own, your own, this, this is the, God said, this is the way, walk you in it. When you hear that voice behind you saying, this is the way, Ah, walk in it. But we said, no, 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 no. It's gotten wider and wider. And that's what God says. It gets broader, doesn't it? And hasn't it gotten real wide? Yeah. But God said, we need to bring, we need to, need, need to bring that back in there. Okay. Let me ask you a question about, about our pride. Have you, ever been, have you ever been proud of something that you did or you know, accomplished or received or whatever. Okay. What do you think that meant in light of what we're saying, what God is concerned about as far as pride is concerned? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you you have a child that uh, has struggled academically, and that child really gets tutored, and uh, works hard and studies like crazy, and makes the honor roll and gets a scholarship to college. And you tell somebody, "I'm really proud of my son because he put in the time and the effort." Is that wrong? No. I I think when we when we think about this word. We need to draw it all the way out to see where it ends. Okay? Because I realized that it's been by the grace of God and some dedicated teachers and all of that that he was able to learn this stuff and he was able to, to get on the honor roll and get a scholarship. Okay? That it's not just about him and these folks, it's about somebody else. But it, <laughs> here again, it's easy to for the enemy to slip in there to say, no, this is about you. And you go to Nebuchadnezzar route. I, 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 I. Um, I, I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed in school. And, um, but God, God helped me to get through all that stuff. Okay, love it. Um, <laughs> tell you a story. It wasn't just me. When I went to NIAC, um, theology and, and philosophy were, 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 were twin brothers. So back in those days, uh, those two disciplines were locked. So you had, to, you had to take a lot of philosophy and a whole lot of theology. I remember we took the, the person who taught the, 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 the class taught philosophy like we were all philosophy majors, and we had a stack of books like this and all this stuff. I remember the first test we took. The girl sitting in front of me ultimately was the, what the, that, the, the valedictorian or whatever. She was, she was like head and shoulders of everybody. 
when she got a when she got a test score back, and it was a seventy something, I said, "Gary, you are in trouble." <laughs> <laughs> and so I won't tell you what I got, but I but I got a C. But I, I said to myself, "It's kind of ridiculous." I thought some stuff. It's kind of ridiculous if you have to grade on that kind of a curve. That either something wrong with the test or something. If the smartest person in the school is a 70 and everybody else is getting 50s and all that, that's, that's, that's kind of crazy. So all, all I'm saying is that somewhere along the line, we, we, under, we understand that, that we, we can come up short here. And the only, way we, the only way we keep going the direction God wants us to go is that we stay dependent, dependent on him, whether it's academically, physically, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, the whole realm of, of, of who we are. So, family, uh, direction. Uh, finally, when, when, when we look at, let me get my last page here. It seems that <laughs> with all of these, with these nations, they had a handle on stuff. A handle on possessions, materialism. How, how do we as Christians deal with stuff? Do we want to get more stuff? And as that comedian said years ago, I can't watch him anymore because of the context of where he went. But he told that, that story about he needed a bigger house because he needed a, a room for his stuff. And so then you need more room in that house for, for the rest of your stuff. And we keep, keep accumulating. And look like we get more and more stuff. And the more stuff we have, what's the rest of that phrase? The more stuff has us. Okay. The more stuff, we, not everybody now, but the more stuff that these nations had, the more the stuff had them. And that become a that became a weakness. So whatever is whatever the, whatever is the stuff that you have, you, you need to be looking at that to say, I don't want this to turn into a weakness here. I want this to remain a strength that can be used to the glory and the honor of God. Because like the pastor said, when you look at this thing against Israel, against Jerusalem, we're not exempt, folks. We're not, we're not exempt. God loves us. God wants the best for us. So do, do, we, do we leave here today saying, Lord, I realize that this message, when I go back and I read chapter 13 through 23, I see your heart. I see what you want from me. I see what you want from me. I see what you want from the United States of America. And I see how I can have an impact on that happening. And a lot of people say, well, you really don't have as much impact as you think you have just because you vote. Well, you, you, are, you should vote. And you should vote for the, for the best candidate and so on. That's a whole nother lesson. But, but the point is, as I'm looking at my life and my stage, where I am, God has still got me here. I'm still here. He's not finished with me, and he's not finished with any of us. So when you leave and you start thinking about your strengths, uh, even good stuff, good enterprises can become God and gods in themselves. Good things can become gods in themselves, right? Uh, if you don't believe it, just look at your life and see how very slowly some of the stuff that you dedicated to God it, it, it just kept growing. And after a while, you know, you started maybe thinking, yeah, God helped me to get that, but I, I, and then you get into the eyes. And that's very easy to do. Um, I, I look back at one, one thing I was proud of, and, and I look, and I say, yeah, I, I guess in one sense I should have been, when I was in high school, you know, to make the varsity baseball team, they put a list up. And so everybody would go, if you saw the movie Rudy, you know, 
how many of us, yeah, they go look at the list, right? So, you know, you go to the gym and you look at the list to see if, if your name is there. And boy, you know, it's just something, you know, you got, you got a high school with seven, 800 people in it. And that's just 10th, 11th, 12th grade. That's a lot of people, a lot of people trying out for the team and you make the team. So you, you feel proud about that because of the ability. And at that point, I didn't think about the fact that God may be able to catch a ball, hit a ball, not hit a ball so much, but catch a ball <laughs> and run. I was proud. When I look back at that, I wish at that point I could have given God the glory. I didn't. I was just proud of the fact that I, that I made that. Okay. Let, me, let me pray with you tonight, on this morning, and to, and to thank God for his word and what he's saying to you. So God is speaking to somebody right now. I'm not going down that road, but I know he is because this always happens. God is speaking to you. And he's, and, he, and he's saying, I have a plan. I have a plan. I have a plan for this nation. I have a plan for your community. I have a plan for your family. I have a plan. And I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. Not what you think should be done, how it should be done, when it should be done. But to trust me, to rely upon me, to look to me. So, Lord, that, that's what we're asking. We're asking a new and a fresh today for our country, for our neighborhoods, for churches that we, we would get back. We would get back to where you want us to be, doing what you want us to do, how you want us to do it, by your grace and by your mercy and by your power. Lord, we, we, we are totally dependent upon you. And Lord, as the old, old, old expositor said years ago, we, 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 we are not manufacturers. We are just distributors. So Lord, help us to get on board with what you're manu manufacturing, that it can be delivered by your grace and by your power at the right time, at the right place, at the right people. For your glory, Lord, not for ours, but for your glory, that the world might see that you make the difference, that you make the difference in all the circumstances of life, whether it be government, whether, whether it be politics, whether it be sociological, economical, psychological, Lord, whatever it might be, that you make the difference. So, Lord, we just pause this, give you praise and give you glory. Lord, we love you. We just pause. We love you, Lord, because you brought us this far. As the old folks used to say, you're not going to leave us now. You're not going to leave us now. So help us to be totally dependent upon you, to rely upon you, to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We do what you want us to do. Be who you want us to be. Go where you want us to go. That ultimately your name would be exalted. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here today. Lord, speak to our hearts today. At this time, that you would make a difference. You would make a difference. How we see ourselves, how we see others, how we see our nation, how we see what you're doing. Help us to get on board with that. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen folks. Lord willing, we'll see you Wednesday. Back here. All right. Hey man, how you doing, brother? Yeah, how's your time? Yeah, no. Yeah, how's it going? Oh, just fine.